Hey everybody, and welcome to SGD 114 Modeling 1. This might be the first video you're watching, so I want to introduce you and welcome you to the class. <clears throat> In this video, we will be covering how we can download Maya and how we can start navigating some of the menu systems and some of the workspaces inside of Maya. So I wanted to get started off by seeing how we could download Maya. You can see on my screen right now, I'm uh, at the autodesk.com website. If you follow the outliner, I have a bunch of links that will help you guys. Here's the outliner that I've linked in your course. I have a bunch of links that will help you get started, so maybe uh, it'll make it the process a little bit easier. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, navigate to autodesk.com, and then we're going to go to sign in at the top here. Um, this process is going to be for downloading Maya in case you want to have it at home or you're taking this class solely online. So you'll be able to, you'll probably, probably be a good idea to have the program at home if, um, if you're going to be working outside of class. So if we go to sign in and select education community right there, <clears throat> I've already have my account. But what you'll do is you'll go to signing up right here. So if you go to signing up, then you're going to select your country. So the United Arab Immigrant. Im yeah, I'm not there. And then you're going to select your role. So you'll probably select student. You'll do all this stuff April 1st, uh, 1924. I'm an old prankster. And then you'll sign up with your name. John, that's a Greek name, Bukadidi, no, I just made that up. And then you will use your webmail address at webmail.blueridge.edu, and then set your passwords. This is probably the most important part of the step because Maya will recognize, or Autodesk will recognize the .edu in your web address, and this is what kind of gives you your ticket into being able to download the software for free. So I'm not going to go any further in the sign-up process. I'm going to assume you guys uh, know how to do this. And we're going to go ahead and pretend like I've already registered and verified my account through my Blue Ridge email. And then we're going to navigate. Let's go back to... Let's go back to the home page here. Like we just did all that stuff and we're coming back to Autodesk. Now I'm going to go to sign in. and select education community. And here is my account information that I just used. And then I'm simply going to sign in. <clears throat> and this is the education community homepage. I have a, uh, do I have a link there? If not, then you can always get to it at the login uh, and then sign in to the education community. Uh, right here is our education home. It's kind of it has like a, little marketing page telling you everything they have to offer you. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to get free software. And here is like some of the featured stuff here. Um, more than likely, Maya will be on the featured products list. It's listed right there. But if you, uh, if for some reason it gets knocked off there, we'll go to all products. And then we'll find Maya. Here it is right here. And avoid Maya extension LT, LT extension. We just want Maya. All right, and hopefully you're in signed in by now. If not, it will prompt you to sign into your account. And then we're going to always select the most recent version. So 2016 is the most recent version, and I'm using Windows, and I speak English. And this is pretty important stuff right here, uh, the serial key and the product key. During the installation, Maya may ask you to record that. So I'm going to select Notepad here and make a little note of this. So I'm going to copy and paste this information, like so, and then I'll just save it to uh, my desktop, but then I'll probably move it to somewhere safe, so I'll say my uh, serial info. And now I have my product key and my serial number for my educational license. You can install Maya with these license numbers up 
to two on the two advice devices. So if you have a desktop and a laptop, you're all set. All right. So after you do that, you just go to install now and do the usual follow your uh, prompts and follow your heart to a road of video game modeling development. And after you do all that and get my installed, then you'll be able to uh, open the program up. So I'm going to pretend like we just got through with the installation process. And we're going to open Maya for the very first time. So I'll navigate to my Maya 2016 right here. And give it a second to open up. I have a solid state drive, so yeah, things are a little fast. And this is what we see. You may have some pop-ups saying, would you like a tour of Maya? Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to watch some of those videos or see some of the things they have to offer there if it's your first time. But I'm going to pretend like maybe you've already done all that or you're comfortable enough with Maya already where you uh, are just ready to go ahead and get started. And I think most of my settings are set to the default of what you'll see. If not, uh, it might be a little confusing, but we'll, we'll get into it. Um, when I start introducing all the menus and uh, toolbars up here, you'll start to see um, how we can navigate and uh, get the different parts of the software here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start going over some of these menu bars. Maya is a very uh, intimidating program if you've never used it before because we have one, two, three different menus at the top and then all these windows and toolbar, even more toolbars. And here's an even uh, another window with another toolbar. So it can be a little confusing. So what this video is going to do, it's going to introduce only the things that we will be using within Modeling 1. Um, I, might, I might preview some things we'll use in future classes, but we'll wait till those classes to get really into those UI elements. I'm just going to focus on what we're going to need for this class. It's still a lot of things, but it's not everything. And everything in Maya is a lot of things. Trust me, this program is very full-featured. So what we'll do is we'll start out by just exploring our basic menus up here. So I'm going to start out by talking about file. Now file is a very uh, kind of, well, every program has file. Why don't, file, why don't we need to go through it? Well, we have the usual suspects such as uh, <clears throat> new scene and open, well, that's not a usual suspect. What are scenes? Basically, scenes are the default file inside of Maya. Um, basically, everything you see in this viewport right here, everything that we're working with is called a scene. So you can create a new scene, and it'll kind of just get rid of everything you're working with right here and just bring up a, a fresh one. Or you can go to Open Scene, and you can navigate to wherever your saved scenes are. Uh, the saved scenes, yeah, we're going to be talking about scenes a lot. So <clears throat> save scene, we'll just go ahead and save what you're working with. Um, save as will allow you to rename it if you want. So I'm going to go ahead and do a save as, and I'm just on my desktop for right now. Um, typically, we will never save anything straight to the desktop. That's a big no-no. Uh, your desktop is only used for temporary uh, files. So if you have just something you're working with real quick, desktop. But after you're done working with it, either trash it or file it away in a logical position. So we'll say this is test test scene and we'll go ahead and save that and then if we go to open scene and I navigate to my desktop or actually where was I hmm if you ever get lost <clears throat> like I just gracefully did you can always go uh, up one level or back one screen using these buttons right here so what Maya did is it automatically made a default project you can see it's in projects right there and we'll talk about projects in a few minutes so that's fine um, there's my test scene that I can open I can go ahead and open that and of course nothing was in it so can't really see any changes a very important thing that we'll be using in this class are called increment saves so an increment save takes what you're working with right now and I'll go ahead and make a little sphere here just so we have something in the scene, and I'll make a little cube. So there's my sphere and cube, and they're arranged in a very uh, particular way. 
what we'll do is we'll go ahead and press increment and save <clears throat> my last you to continue and well what did that do well let me move my square over here now and make it really big i'm going to press increment and save again and let's see what the, what happened by going to open scene we can see that I have two new saves called test.0001 and test.0002. <clears throat> Basically, increment saves creates a brand new save with the same kind of naming convention, such as test right there. And it creates a new uh, save with a new number. So as you're working along, you can save previous versions of the scene you were working with without always overriding it and only having one file. <clears throat> I've seen this happen quite a few times. Somebody's working in Maya, and then their file crashes, their Maya crashes, and their file scene becomes corrupt, and they can't open their scene anymore. So if I open up test 001, I have a previous version of what I was working with. If I open up test 002, there's my scene with the bigger cube. So always be increment saving. And the keyboard shortcut for that is Control, Alt, and S. So I'll press Control, Alt, and S. All right. I guess, uh, yeah. So I'll just, I don't know if that shortcut worked or not. There we go. Things are working a little bit better now. So I'll do an increment and save. But there's nothing to save, so it's not allowing me to. I'll make my sphere a little bit bigger, and I'll do a new increment and save. Now that I've made changes to my scene, I can continue with that, and I can open up 002 back. I can go to open scene and open up 0003, and there is the scene with the larger sphere. So that's a very useful feature there. Uh, the next thing, let me undo that. The next thing we'll be looking at is import and export. So let me talk about export first. What I can do is I can select that sphere and go to export selection. And it'll ask me to, uh, you can see all my usual file scenes here. And then just because I have the sphere selected, I'm going to save a new scene called Sphere. And it looks like it's saving, right? But if we open up Scene and select Sphere, we only have the scene with the sphere because it only exported the model that I had open. That's useful because if we go back to scene 003, I delete my sphere, but I can't bring it back because uh, for whatever reason. Well, I can go to File and Import and select my scene with sphere, and it will import every single thing inside of my sphere here. Any, any, every single object and animation inside the scene, and it'll bring back my sphere for me. And if I select both objects again and go to, uh, or I get, yeah, let's just do this. Let's just go to import. I'll move these out of the way and make them small. So I'll go to file and, and import. Now I can import any scene that I want into my current scene. So test 0003 had the large cube in the large sphere. So if I import that, I import those, everything that was in that scene, which were these two big shapes here. So very important um, file type management stuff. Um, one more thing I, thing I want to talk about, sorry, my throat's going out a little bit, is the project window right here. Um, this will be directly linked to your turn-in assignments. Um, there will be a video where it shows you how to set up the project window. But right here, um, you probably haven't watched that yet, so I'll go ahead and preview it. Uh, a projects in my are kind of like predefined little uh, file structures that make all these different folders for you. So whenever you save things, Maya automatically put, puts things in the correct places. And it's what we'll be working with in the future in the class whenever you turn in your uh, assignments. It makes, uh, it makes the process a lot easier for you and for me. So what we'll do is we'll go to new and then we'll name it something like test. And then we can navigate where we want to put it. So I'll put it on my desktop. And I'll select that. 
and we have all these different scenes. You can even make custom folders, so I can make a custom test folder, like so. If we go down to custom data locations, and we do accept. And if I navigate to my desktop, right here, we can see that I have my test folder right here that I just made. And when I open it up, here we go. I have folders for scenes that I can save in, sound, images, all that good stuff. So I'll minimize that window and I'll bring it back up. So what we'll do is, why don't we go ahead and import? Well, now we're in a different test scene. So what we'll do is we'll create some new primitives. I'll create a cylinder right there. And then what I want to do is I'm going to go back to my old save and import what I was working with into this new project. Because if I go to open scene, I'm now in my test folder that <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, now that we're done with files, why don't we look at the edit menu? All right. So the edit menu, and I'm going to break it off by selecting this little perforated dotted line icon right there. Now the edit is pretty nice because it gives us more tools to work with, uh, such as uh, cut and paste and copy. Um, not going to be using that too much inside of Maya. Um, I've never really found workflows for it too much. It's not. I guess you could, uh, I don't know, take one of these spheres and cut it and then paste. But every time you cut something, it asks you to save the file. So it really gets in the way of your workflow process. There are other tools that will work better than copying and pasting. And uh, we'll get to those in a second. The next thing we're going to be using in this class is delete all by type and then history. This right here will clear all the uh, junk that gets clogged up inside of Maya as you're working in your projects. And if you do too many operations and too many different things, uh, Maya can start slowing down. So if we go to, to edit, delete all by type history, it can clean up your scene and maybe get it working a little bit faster. All right. And then remember when we were talking about, let's open up that original scene I had. Remember when we were talking about uh, cut and pasting and why it wasn't the best idea in Maya? Well, that's because we have duplicate and duplicate special. All right. So if I select the sphere and go to edit and duplicate, nothing happened. But if, if I move it over, there we go. Control D also helps you duplicate. And that'll be covered in future videos. So I'm going to start moving a little bit at a faster clip now that I've explained how the files and scene systems work here. Most everything I discuss here will be covered in future videos. So let's just kind of go through it so you can get an idea of all the different menus um, that, are being, that are used here. Control Z will undo. We also have the undo buttons right there. Um, I just kind of mentioned that. I'll get back to it in a second. Uh, but I wanted to bring back some of these things here. So we also have the edit group. So what did that do? Well, I'll show you in a second what that did when we get into the outliner and ungroup. So that's edit for us. Let's check out the create menu now. So I'll go ahead and get rid of these because now that we're going to learn how to create things, I can create my own shapes now. So I'll go to create. And we're primarily going to be working with polygonal primitives or polygon primitives. And right here, I can create a sphere, like so. I can go to and create a plane, so just a flat 2D shape, like so. And I can create a whole bunch of uh, shapes made out of polygons. Um, Probably a lot of you might be wondering what, what polygons are or why models are made of polygons or even how to move the camera and start moving objects and scaling objects. We'll get that into that after we go through the menu. I just want you guys to kind of soak in what all these different tools do up here. 
We can also create lights, such as a point light right here. So let me bring in my sphere. So that'll allow us to kind of add lights to our scene. So you can see as I move my light, the shape here is receiving different types of light. So I'll disable that light, get rid of it. We can also make uh, different cameras for whenever we get into rendering at the end of the semester and curves whenever we start working with NURBS. And we'll get into that in the NURBS chapter. Uh, I think as far as creates, and here we have a free image plane right here. Uh, we'll be using this whenever we start learning how to create weapon props and things of that nature. You can import uh, concept art directly into Maya and use it to model off of, so you have a reference right behind your model. Next, we have the select menu, and there's a lot of things here. Let me go ahead and duplicate the cylinder a few times. So if we go to select and select all, it'll select every single thing in your scene, lights, cameras, models, what have you. I can also select maybe just two of the cylinders right here and go to a select inverse, and it'll select everything that was not already selected. So it switches up what you have selected. Uh, we also have grow and shrink right here. And we'll show you how to get, how to use that in future projects. Uh, here's a little preview. So if I have one face selected right there, I can go to select and grow that selection. And it selects every single adjoining face on the model. So that can be useful for a different, uh, for a numerous various little techniques and tricks. And then we have objects and components toggle right here, F8 on the keyboard. Um, we'll get into objects and components in the next chapter. Uh, basically what it means is object will be able to select the whole model here. Components will be able to select a component like a face and just work with that single face. So object is the whole thing. Components are the various components that make up a model. Again, we'll be getting into that in the future. Um, modify is another pretty important little menu here. I'm going to break it off because I'm going to be referring to it often. All right, so we have my modify window right there. So why don't we go through some of the things that I find most useful for it? Transformation tools. Oh, if we so if we hover over it, then we get another little pop up window, and then we can select my rotate tool, or my scale tool, or my move tool. That's pretty cool. That's how we can start moving things around. There's a lot, there's many more, fast, there's a lot more fast, uh, there's quicker ways to select things, <laughs> yeah, is what I'm trying to say. Um, move, scale, rotate, but these are the basic ways to get to those different tools. So you can start moving, rotating, and scaling your models. All right. Uh, reset transformations is another important one. I want you guys to look at this little uh, handlebar. Let me move this guy out of the way. I want you guys to look at this little handlebar right here. You see the green arrow and the yellow arrow and the blue arrow. And I'll reset the transformations. Oh, it, it takes my object and puts it in the center of the map. Basically, transformations are the values of where it's positioned. So an X, Y, Z position. It's XYZ rotation and it's XYZ scale values. All those values are tracked in the channel box over here on the right. And we'll get into the channel box in a second. Um, but I want you guys to see what happens to all these numbers when I press reset transformations. They get all zeroed out. I want to do that. Conversely, if you do freeze transformations, I'll do that. You can see that my handlebar is orientated in the right direction again, up, down, left, and right. And now all the numbers over here are zeroed out and my model stays in the same position. Um, center pivot could be useful. For instance, uh, maybe one time your handlebars are way down over here. There will be instances where this happens. 
And you need to get it at the center of your model again. So in your modify menu, I'll just click center pivot and it brings my arrows back for me. Really good stuff. Um, convert, we'll be using convert in the polygons and or in the NURBS chapter, but it basically allows you to switch between NURBS and polygons, which are two different types of ways models are, are made and manipulated. Basically two different types of models. So let's start talking about the display menu now. I'll get rid of my modify and I'll select display and select this little tear off icon right there and just drag it down right there for us. Same menus. I'm just dragging it off so I don't have to keep selecting over and over again. I can toggle the grid off and on to see the grid on my screen. I always keep my grid on unless I'm doing some uh, specific things. So rule of thumb is to keep your grid checked. Your heads up display is pretty important. Um, if you guys are wondering what this little uh, these, this little grid or this little chart of numbers are, it's my poly count. So if you go to heads up display and then navigate the poly count and check that, I can turn it off and on. And your poly count shows you basically how many uh, vertices, faces, uh, edges you have on a particular model and in your total scene right here. That'll be a useful tool when we start getting into uh, real-time models where we have to start worrying about how many polygons we have in our models. Okay, so I usually just keep that on and I would I would keep it on if I were you to just to get used used to seeing it. Uh, yeah, hey, UI elements, heads up display, we got that. Uh, restore UI elements. This will be a pretty important one. Say for instance, your status line goes away, like that menu's gone, or uh, UI elements, your shelf's gone. Oh man, we're losing everything. I'm unchecking everything. See how I'm losing all of my different menus here? I even lost my toolbox on the right. My attribute editor's gone. My channel box is gone. So I'm working in a bare bones scene, and a lot of things have been hidden that I'm we're going to be using a lot. If that ever happens to you, go to Restore UI Elements. Show all UI elements is what I meant to say. And it'll bring back everything for you. So don't panic. Just go to Display, UI Elements, Show All UI Elements, and it'll bring it all back for you. Um, hide and Show. If I select an object here, I can go to Hide and Hide the Selection and it makes it invisible. It still exists within my scene. Go to show and all or show last hidden and it'll bring it back. I can even select multiple things and hide those selections and then go to show all. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Hide your selection, show your selection or show the last thing you hidden or show everything in your scene. So kind of a useful way of quickly kind of getting something out of your view area so you may be able to focus on something else. Uh, if we go down to polygons right here, there's a few different things that we can see on polygons, uh, such as which way the faces are pointing. So if I select this little ganked up cylinder, and go to polygons and go to face normals, you can see that I have green lines protruding from every single polygonal face on my model here. Faces do have a direction. And that'll be important in future uh, projects because in video games, only one side of the polygon is ever rendered. So it will only render the side of the polygon with the green arrows or the green lines coming out from it. So that can be a pretty useful tool if you want to see which way your faces are pointing. And to turn it off, I'll select my object again and go to face normals and turn that back off. Okay, moving right along. So now that we're done talking about display, one last thing we're gonna talk about uh, as far as this toolbar goes is go to Windows and we'll tear Windows off. And I just did a play blast on accident, so that's good. We'll be using those in the animation class, so we're not gonna be talking about those. Here are my Windows right here, and I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of that tool setting so I can get more real estate here. Windows are basically 
uh, every single little uh, window or UI element you see, your channel box window, your scene view window that we're working with here, all that good stuff. So what windows and what kind of menus are we going to be working with in this class that we're going to need to know about? Well, going down the line here, we'll skip animation, we'll skip general, we'll skip relationship, and in rendering editors, though, we can see that we have the hypershade in green. If I bring up the hypershade window and pull it off from my other screen, here we can see my materials window where I can start making different colors for my objects here. And I can resize it to my heart's content. I can make a, a new material, apply it to that, and then start adjusting the color of my models there by using the hypershade window. And these little spheres are called materials because you're like painting the object or the model with a material like red paint. That's a generalized, generalized explanation, guys. We'll get into those in a few chapters or towards the end of this course we'll get into textures all right so what other windows do we have working with us uh settings and preferences um preferences is a pretty good one this is basically the nerve center of uh your maya and how it operates um don't mess with it too much and if things ever get messed up in your maya you can go to, I'll go to the process right here. You can go to Windows, Settings and Preferences, and select Preferences. And then go to Edit, and then go to Restore Default Settings. And that'll make sure everything, for the most part, goes back to where it was, the way you liked it. If everything, anything ever gets messed up, and it will. Maya can be a, a bit frustrating at first. But with knowing how to reset our Display, go to uh, UI elements, show all UI elements. And now we know how to go to settings and preferences, preferences, and go to restore default. Now we know how to make sure that we're always working with our default settings that Maya has for us when we open up the program. That's a pretty important little thing there. So I'll drag Windows back off here. In fact, I'm going to move it over here because we have a very important menu. And I'm, we're going to be using this in every single assignment from now on. So this is a pretty big one, and it's called the Outliner. I'm going to drag it over here. The Outliner is a list of everything in your scene here. Um, notice how I have cylinder one, two, and three. This allows you to rearrange how they're listed by middle mouse clicking and dragging. You can double click it to name it. So you can call it cylinder uh, one mesh. So double clicking things and renaming them will be a very important thing that you guys will be doing. I am a huge stickler on naming things in your outliner and organizing things. Uh, it just helps keep you in the right headspace and not getting confused in your own scene. And it helps me whenever I or somebody else that's not you opens up your file. Now they can now they have a index or a table of contents. To everything in your scene. If they are just all named cylinder, 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 they're not really going to know what what's going on here. And in fact, I'm going to select this cylinder and rename it the cylinder red because that's my red cylinder. So when somebody opens up my scene, and I'll name that to gray, and I'll just get rid of that one for right now. So when somebody opens up my scene and opens up my outliner, they know how to select my gray cylinder. And they know how to get to my red cylinder. So the outliner will be very important. And in fact, you'll probably see in most videos that I'm using, I'll have the outliner sit, sitting right here at all times. Or, um, and if I were you, you could always put it on a second screen. So I'm dragging it over to a second screen there. So I always have my outliner open on my second screen or wherever I can see it very easily. It's just the table of contents to your scene, and it's great. It also has a lot of other features that we'll get into in the future as well. So the outliner is very important. Um, if I go over to my windows over here, my windows uh, pull off. Remember, I uh, went to windows and tore it off like so. Now, if I go to my UV editor, this right here 
was where I will be working with textures that get applied to models. So that'll be an important window when we start getting into textures. All right, great. Uh, view arrangement. Basically, I can go to a single pane. I can go to two panes side by side. Now we have two different views of the same scene. One where I'm just looking at it from anywhere. And one where I'm looking at it solely from the side. Which brings me to my next point of being able to kind of navigate. Um, well, we'll get into navigation of the, s the scene windows in the next uh, bit of the video. So this looks weird right now. So I'm going to go back to view arrangement and go to single pane. That's, uh, that's the one I like. Um, save layouts is a very important one. By default, Maya is set to four view. You just don't know it because four view gives you views. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. And when I minimize my outliner, it goes down here for me instead of in my uh, bar, my windows bar at the bottom. Four view gives you a view of just a free camera, the perspective view. I have the side view of my scene. Here's a view from the front, and here's a view from the top. If you ever get in this view, I can hover my uh, mouse and click a particular scene here or a particular view and then press spacebar and it'll zoom into it. Conversely, if I just press spacebar real quick, just tap it because if not, you bring up this radial menu. So just tap it real quick and then we'll go back into four view and I can go over into top or front or side. I'm just hovering my cursor over which view. I want to enlarge. So windows, save layouts, four view is what we're going to be using. If you do the single single perspective view, I guess that could work too, yeah. Single uh, viewed layout, single perspective view. There we go. That allows you to go back to just the big one, but we know how to go through them with just tapping the space bar. So I'll quit making everybody nauseous now. Uh, frame all selections in view. This is a pretty important one. So if I select these things here and then my mouse gets way over here, I can go to windows and frame selection in all views. And that gives, yeah, let's do something like this. Let's mess up. So I have my cylinder selected, but I don't see them in any of my scenes, scene views right here. I can go to windows frame selection in all views and here we have everything that i have selected all framed nicely in my views here if you want to do something a little bit quicker i could just press f and a keyboard shortcut will zoom it but only in a single view here only in a single view screen f on the keyboard we'll get into the uh using f to focus on objects in a second all right, so that does it for the menus up here. Why don't we look at, uh, switch gears totally and look at some uh, new windows here. I've already mentioned my channel box. Remember when we had all those numbers that were resetting to zero earlier? Your channel box is a very important thing. So I can get rid of it by pressing the X. And if I ever want to bring back the channel box, these little icons up here in the top left. Let me redo that zoom. These little icons here at the top left, these will bring back your outliners, or yeah, your channel box rather, and your attribute editor. I'll press the little stack squares to bring up my channel box. This has information such as the position of my cylinder. So as I move it, you can see over here in my channel box, you can see those values shifting. If I rotate it, you can really see those values changing. And notice how there's one for X, Y, and Z. If I just rotate in the Z direction, I can only rotate around that axis. Think of it like a planet rotating around the globe. And then you can also scale in one direction. So these cubes right here kind of... Uh, dictate what axis and what direction you want to scale, move, or rotate things in. And that's our channel box. I usually have my channel box open at all times too. And in some situations, you might need to open up your attribute editor 
There might be some uh, few different tools that will or settings we'll have to tweak over here. And then open up your attribute editor. It'll be your second listed little icon right here. I have no idea how to describe the shape here. Um, I don't know, rectangles with lines uh, going into them where they look like uh, popsicles. That's what that icon means. Uh, but it that popsicle thing opens up our attribute editor. And it shows different attributes associated to whatever uh, objects you have selected in your scene here. Next, we have something called the status line. And your status line kind of gives you the status of everything that's going on currently in your scene. Um, in this drop down menu, we can select different uh, packages, kind of different things inside of Maya. You'll notice if I select modeling, the second half of my file menu, my menu bar up here changes. If I go to the animation, it changes to something else. So we're always going to make sure we're in modeling. So if you can't find the menus that you're looking for, your first suspect should be you have to make sure if you're in modeling in this drop down menu here. Here we have open, save, undo, uh, some uh, file scene management stuff. Right here we have uh, uh, components versus objects here. So if you go to objects, all objects, I can select every object in my scene. If I go to polygons, I can only select po the polygons in my scene here. Um, right here is our components versus object selection. So you can see if I select objects right there, Components versus objects, very important. Remember components for things like edges, vertices, and faces. Objects allow me to select the full model. If I go to components, then I can select specific components on my model. And inside of components mode, I can pick what component I wanna select. So do I wanna select, uh, let's see. I go to components. Do I want to select just faces or points? Actually, vertices, points. Do I want to select just edges? So I can click and de-click and select just the components I want. And if you hover over it, it'll give you a tooltip for what you're trying to select. So that's faces. So I can only select faces now. That's edges. So I can only select edges. And here are vertices. So I can only select the vertices on my model. And here we have snap settings. Snap settings will be important in the future because it would allow us to align models up to uh, the grid, for instance. So as I hold down X or if I select the grid snap option, I only snap to parts, intersections of the grid here. So you can see that no matter how much I move, it's always going to snap to the grid intersections. I can also have it snap to points. So I can have this vertice snap to other vertices only. And we'll be using uh, grid snap and point snap so we can snap vertices. We'll be using those exclusively in this class. Um, there are a few other snap modes that we'll get it, that we may you may use in the future, but grid and point snap what we'll be using in the class. All right, and here we have some basic rendering uh, tools right here. Uh, if I just press the blank uh, action little icon right here, right there, then Maya will bring up the rendering window and it renders out my scene pre-rendered. All right, this is not a real-time render, this is pre-rendered, so it's like a frame of an animation or a frame of a movie, a single frame of animation or of a uh, whatever you have of, of a video or a movie. So I can just kind of get a scene of how Maya's lighting something and making it uh, look better. So you can see the difference between these two things, right? It's got a little bit more shade. And if I uh, go to create and put a light and switch into lighting mode and maybe make that a little bit rounder, I can arrange these in a, in a certain way. And with a nice light in my scene, and I press the render button again, I kind of get a different kind of uh, way of it's being of it being presented there. 
All right. We're not going to be doing too much rendering in the class. Maybe at the very last assignment. Since we're in a video game development class or a program, um, pre-rendered stuff inside of Maya isn't going to be a primary concern of ours. We're more interested in looking at getting our things to look the way they should inside of a real-time game engine like Unity. You know, where things are having to be drawn uh, at 30 times in one second. So, yeah. Pre-rendered, so, some pre-rendered scenes, uh, images can take up to 30 minutes for a single frame. So that's 30 frames per second or 30 seconds or 30 minutes per one frame. Yeah, so that's the difference between pre-rendered and uh, real time. I've already kind of talked about the different shelves we have. Um, but to select a shelf, what is a shelf? Well, your shelf are these guys right here. These are little quick shortcut keys to the various uh, tools that we'll be using over and over again. We will be living inside of polygons. So another, if you get used to working with these tools right here, and then all of a sudden, you know, you see something like this, you're confused. That's because on your shelf, you need to select polygons. And these have all the different, see here we have a create sphere tool. Um, here we have a tool that combines two models into one selectable object. Uh, just different things of that nature and that we'll get into more when we start talking about specific tools for our polygons here. So shelves, very important to make sure you're in the right shelf so you can start using some of these shortcuts right here. Again, I want to reiterate on the outliner that we'll be using. So I'll go to Windows and Outliner. Um, this is an uh, outliner that has everything listed in it that is in your scene. So why don't we take this time to organize my scene with what I have going on right now by renaming things inside of my outliner. Now the first thing I have is this group that I can expand and contract. And I have this grayed out transform. But when I select it, okay, it does that. But it's typically anything that's grayed out like that is kind of trash that you need to clean up. So we'll go to edit, delete all by type in history. And that gets rid of all those unused groups inside of your outliner. All right. So here's my cylinder uh, red mesh. But it's not really too much of a cylinder now. It's uh, more of just a shape. So I'll double click it and call it shape. And it's the first one I have in my scene. And underscore mesh because it's a polygonal mesh. Um, inside of Maya, uh, it doesn't like things to be called uh, by the same name. So if you have a layer called shape red 001 and a model called shape red 001, Maya won't like that. So I give everything a suffix depending on what kind of material it is. So here's my light. So I can call this uh, key light uh, point for a point light. Right here is my combined group that I just made. So I can call this combined uh, shapes. And I always use underscores. I never use spaces. Because even if you do use spaces, Maya automatically makes it into underscores for you. Combined shapes. But I'm not done with that naming convention. Very specific way we name things. Which version of it is it is. So it's the first version. And what is it? It's a mesh. So we will call this thing combined shape uh, one mesh. And there we go. So using our outliner, we can uh, really organize our scene. We can even create custom groups inside of Maya. So we can group together all of my polygons. So I can select both of my meshes. I'll go to edit and go to group. And now I have a group with just my meshes. So I can call this mesh group like so and I capitalize my groups so now I have a group that I can collapse and expand and I can even hit control G to do the same thing and I'll make a group for light so if I make any more lights in my scene they'll all be populated 
inside of that group. Same thing. If I select my shape red 001 mesh and duplicate it, there we go. Well, here's an interesting thing. When I duplicated it, it did a mesh and a mesh one. Hmm. That's not intended behavior. I don't I didn't want that to happen. I wanted that number to be what Maya updated it. So what I'll do is I'll delete that and I'll rethink my naming convention. I'll do shape red. What is it? A mesh. And then I'll give it its number. So look what happens now when I duplicate this shape. Let me bring this over. I'll duplicate it. Now Maya automatically updates the number for me because I put the number at the end. So with some quick naming convention stuff, I now have set up a duplication type setup where everything, every time I duplicate, Maya's keeping my same naming convention for me. Very nice stuff. So I've gone over the UI stuff. Why don't we start talking about how we can work within 3D space, okay? The first thing we're gonna start out with is by the Cartesian coordinate system. So if I go into my side view here, hopefully by this point you guys have seen something like this, a four quadrant system. Um, my zero axis is marked by this darker gray line. Let me just clean up my scene here. So uh, quadrant one is all positive. X, y, and Z, X and Y are positive. Quadrant two, X is negative and Y is positive over in here. Quadrant three, both X and Y are negative. And quadrant four, negative uh, or positive X and negative Y. That'll be important whenever we start work working with primitives. So I'm going to go ahead and make a sphere. I'm going to double click my transform box to open it up. And I want you guys to start paying special attention to these two values right here on my screen. So I'll zoom in, translate X and Y. Pay attention to those two values. Since my sphere is newly created, it's at the very center. I'll go in the wireframe view. It's at the very center of my grid here. If I move my sphere to quadrant one, the top right hand, well, I'm not in the right view. Let's see, let's redo that. Here we go. This is what I need to be in. Nope. Wrong view again. And first and third time's a charm. Here we go. All right, so I'm in the front view now. That's what I wanted to be in all along, I swear. So if I move my sphere into quadrant one, the top right hand, then you can see my X and Y are both positive, right? If I move my sphere into the quadrant two, then my Y is positive, but my X is negative eight, okay? If I move my sphere into the third quadrant, if we zoom in here and see my values now, I got a negative six and a negative five. So quadrant three, both X and Y are negative. If I move my sphere into quadrant four, then my X is positive and my Y is negative. So getting used to working with coordinate systems inside of Maya will be really helpful because it'll kind of letting you know exactly you know where your shapes are just getting comfortable with the x y and now that we're working in 3d space the x y and now we have a z component so this gives us our depth all right so now we kind of have like <laughs> a matrices of coordinate systems but i won't get into the details with that i just want you guys to know that um origin points that uh, center point exists for all three uh, axes, all three different core, uh, orientations, such as X, Y, and Z. And they correspond to your translate values over here and your channel box. Let me zoom in a little bit better. They correspond over here in our channel box. So those are the coordinate systems. And if I go in and manually edit these values and set them both all at zero, 
then guess what? My sphere goes to the center of the grid again. All right. So let's talk about camera navigation real quick. You've been seeing me doing it. You've probably been wondering how I'm so effortlessly, effortlessly zooming around. Basically, whenever you click something in the scene, you can only it allows you to manipulate objects, right? But when you hold down the Alt key, the alternate key, Alt key on your keyboard, then your left click becomes Rotate. All right, notice how your icon turns into a rotation sign. Your middle click becomes a move camera or pan the camera. You go up, down, left, and right. And your right click becomes a zoom in and zoom out. So getting comfortable with holding down the Alt key and using all three mouse buttons will be very important with being able to navigate a scene. Also, there might be times where uh, you're just kind of rotating around here, and I'm just rotating a random point in space. If I select my sphere and press the F key, now I will rotate and zoom according to the center point of this little sphere here that I had selected when I pressed F. All right, now let's see how we can move, rotate, and scale different things. So there are a few ways we can do it. We can go to uh, Modify, Transformation Tools, and pick the Rotate tool. Now I can rotate the sphere. Or I can use my uh, toolbox over here and select Scale, Move, and Rotate. So there's my Rotate, there's my Scale, and there's my Move. Or, and I, pref I prefer you guys to start using this method, Keep your thumb on the Alt key so you can always move around with the mouse. So keep put your thumb there. Now, start getting used to using your uh, index, middle, and ring finger to switch between Q for selection. So if I press the Q key, I can select things. If I press the W key, I can grab my move handle. If I press the E key, I can rotate. I'm teaching you guys sh keyboard shortcuts. So E is rotate. R is scale. And Q goes back just to selection mode again. So I'm not selecting or moving, rotating, or scaling anything. So with thumb on alternate key, I can zoom around my model. Then I can use my middle finger or my ring finger to, to select Q. I can use my middle finger to press W to move things. I can use my index finger to rotate things, and I can stretch with my index finger and press R to scale things. So I want you guys to kind of uh, maybe pause the video and maybe make a shape or two, and just get used to flying around the shape, moving it with your hot keys on your keyboard, rotating it with uh, E, moving it with W, and scaling it with R. And then getting rid of those little tool handles with Q. And while you're doing that, I want you guys to also pay special care. Let me reset these values over here. I want you guys to pay special care to whenever you press W, this special little handle that comes up. If I uh, select the middle little square, the yellow square here, I can move in all three directions. But yet, if I pick just one of the arrows, I can only move in that direction. So I can only move in the Y or I can only move in the X, or I can only move in the Z. And each of these areas is color coordinated to which axis it, it, it corresponds to. So green is always going to be up and down, the Y axis. Red is always going to be left and right, the X axis. Blue is always going to be forward and back in the Z axis. All right. So there we go. So get used, and that works for every single transformation tool. So if I just want to rotate in the Z axis or the X axis or the Y axis, and notice how they're still color coordinated. So that'll be important to know. And scale works in the same way. Scale has these little cubes. So I can scale in one direction only or scale the whole model. So I want you guys to get used to kind of using those tools real quickly with your hotkeys, and just try grabbing each one of the little handles and start just getting used to stretching and squashing or rotating around an axis or just moving up and down only or left and right only. 
So this uh, is getting a little long in the tooth, the video is. So why don't we go ahead and just kind of finish out the last two bullet points we have uh, and talk about views real quick. So views on your keyboard, very important. Um, they correspond to the view panel right here. This is our scene view we're working with. Um, very important uh, menus up here that we'll get into in the future. Um, if we go in my scene view, if I go to view and look at selection, that's the equivalent of pressing F on the keyboard by framing. Um, and we do have different kind of shading techniques. So shade smooth all, uh, flat shade, but we're going to mainly be using shade smooth all. Um, yeah, that's good. Use default lighting and you can pick what things you want to show. So if you uncheck polygons on show, you're not going to be able to see your polygonal models. All right. We'll get into those uh, menus more often whenever we start using them. But the thing I want you to know now, there are some more keyboard shortcuts. If I press four on the keyboard, I go into wireframe view. So I can see through my model, but I still see the edges and vertices uh, intersections. If I press five, I go into shaded view. So I can see the gray material that's default on all models. If I press six, then if I had a texture on this guy, then it would show me the picture texture. Seven shows the lights in the scene. So there's no lights, so my object is black. For right now, you guys are going to be working with four and five. So get used to switching, pressing four for wireframe and five for shaded. So now that we're working in our scene view right now, this is our scene view. It's our viewport window. All right. And in our viewport window, we have our own menu system at work here. In our view menu, we can frame objects with the F key, frame selection. And it'll frame whatever you had last selected if you don't have something selected. So I can duplicate the shape. Why don't I make it a little bit weirder so we know the difference between the two? So I have this flat shape and this round shape. If I select this object and go to view, Frame selection. Now I'll only rotate around that object. If I select this little flat object and go to view frame selection, I only rotate around it. This is the F key. F on the keyboard allows you to also do this really quickly. So I can focus on that one and I can focus for this one. F for focus. Uh, there's also a few camera settings. Um, if we were going to do some rendering, we could set the film gate and the resolution gate. So in this grayed out area, this is not going to be rendered in our scene. So you can see I have half the model in the gray and half of it in not. So if I press the render, we can see exactly where it's cut off if we select our camera settings and our resolution gate. But we, and when we're working, we're going to be using camera view, camera settings, no gate. All right. And image plane, if you want to select uh, a certain image plane, like remember we were talking about the concept art, importing concept art into here, we can select image plane and put an image plane specifically on this view that we're working currently in. Shading, we kind of already went through. Uh, wireframe, uh, wireframe on shaded is a pretty good one. So if I select wireframe on shaded, then I see the wireframe even. So wireframe mode, even when I go to shaded on with five on the keyboard, I see my topology and edge flow even without it being selected. So that's a pretty nice one. Uh, X-ray allows me to kind of see through objects, make them kind of transparent. So now I can see back behind there. With the X-ray turned off, they turn totally opaque. Um, back face culling, that could be a, uh, that could be a tricky one. So I'll create a cube. So notice now that we're inside the cube. We can see through it because we have back face culling turned off on. If I turn back face culling off by default, then I'm inside the cube and all I see are black faces. So back face culling allows you to see through the back side of your models. Or the back side of the faces on your models. I usually work with that off 
with it turned on, you can kind of get confused on where the actual insides of your models are. Uh, lighting, default lighting is uh, usually what we'll use. If you want to press 7 on the keyboard to see the lights you have in your scene, so I'll create a light or two. I'll put that there. I'll create another one and put this here. So I can't see the lighting. I'll turn wireframe on shaded off. I can't see the lighting until I use all lights. And here I can actually see my lights having an effect on the scene. That's seven on the keyboard. Show. Uh, remember, we uh, can hide our polygons if we select polygons off. So I never recommend doing that. And you can kind of turn your grid off this way too in that view. Things of that nature. Renderer. Uh, always make sure you're using viewpoint 2.0. In the future, we may go to legacy high quality viewport, but selecting that could slow down your scene. So when you're just modeling, viewpoint viewport 2.0 is fine. Panels right here is pretty important. If we go to perspective, persp, then we look through our perspective camera. If we go through orthographic, then we can turn this view into the side view. But remember, we already know how to do that by tapping the space bar. But look what's happened now. Now we have two side views right above each other. So to fix that, I'll go back to panels and I'll select perspective view for this particular viewport window. Um, I can also select maybe this light right here. Let's create a spotlight. All right. So here I have a spotlight. I'm going to delete these other two lights right here. This is a pretty cool little technique. So I have a spotlight, and I'm trying to position it just right so it frames. I can get everything lit, but I'm having a tough time with it. So with my spotlight selected, I can go to Panels, and I can go to Look Through Selected. And now I am the spotlight. So anywhere I look is where the spotlight is going to be projected. And then after you get done with that, it can be a little confusing. I'm still in my spotlight. We'll go to panels, perspective, and go back to your perspective. But I don't expect you guys to use that too much, and maybe until the very end of the of the uh, core, uh, chapter, or rather, uh, end of the modeling course you're taking right now. All right. Next, we'll get into, we've already talked about object uh, selection mode. But let's do a quick recap on different selection modes. If I press F8 on the keyboard, I can switch between object mode, so I can select the whole object, or component mode, where I can only select certain components, like vertices on here. Um, and we'll get into the different components of the, of the models in the very next chapter. But pressing F8 allows you to toggle between them. And F9, F10, and F11 toggles between face, uh, vertice, and edge. Not in that order. I don't know what order I set it in. All right. So we kind of zoomed through uh, the selection modes at the very end, but that's because uh, we're not going to really be uh, selecting components until Chapter 3 or so. I just want to let you guys know that if you find yourself in, like, selecting only faces, if you press F8, a few times, then you'll go back to object mode. All right, so that does it for this video. Hopefully, uh, you're not your mind's not fried. Uh, refer back to the outliner here that I have linked inside of your Moodle, and you can see links. See, I already have the times marked for every part of the video. I just need to link that time that I talked about it here. So there'll be blue hyperlinks where you can go back to and refer to what the Cartesian coordinate system was. So you'll be able to click that and go to the part of the video that it was talking about. All right. I'll also make a glossary and uh, have a glossary that you can link, look at and see what new scene does or open scene does. All right, guys, thanks for watching this. Um, now make sure you uh, take a look at uh, the assignments associated for the chapter. Thank you.